Welcome to the 5D Academy of Higher Consciousness. I'm Zarathustra, your host, and I'm broadcasting live from my new home in Tulum, Mexico. Uh, I have recently migrated uh, to Mexico and I'm very excited about it, uh, starting, starting a new life here and uh, really enjoy living uh, among my Mexican brothers, sisters, which are really, really sweet and beautiful people. And I look forward to get to know them better and looking forward to learn the language. So hopefully maybe next year, this time, I can also broadcast in Spanish. We'll see what happens. Okay, so for the moment, let's just do a simple meditation. And uh, we have spoken about this before. Um, those of you who are new with me, uh, one of the most meditation, uh, let me explain one thing to you, is a nat natural phenomena that occurs during the day to almost everybody. Meditation doesn't have any looks. We have been um, programmed or believe that someone needs to be sitting like this. Uh, a lot of times you see a girl, a woman sitting in a lotus posture. Um, it looks very peaceful. She has her eyes closed and her hands in this posture and we have this image of meditation. But meditation is not limited to a posture. Meditation happens naturally to everyone. It's just most people in the world are not aware that they go into a state of meditation. Meditation is basically to be present and be one with whatever you're doing. So you may be walking on the street, going for a run. Um, you may be ironing, you're cooking, and you're engaged in different uh, activities. Maybe you're painting or you're making music and you become one with what you're doing and that is in a, being in a state of meditation. One of the easiest ways to be able to go to a deep state of meditation is that you divert your attention inwards towards the source of your thoughts. So we all have thoughts and we have noticed the stream of our thoughts and sometimes you cannot identify it or control it or it drives you crazy. But however, there is an awareness that there's thoughts happening in your mind. So you simply divert your attention, bring your attention towards where your thoughts come from. Follow your thoughts inwards to the source. And as you follow your thoughts towards the source, the origin of them, to your surprise, you may discover yourself going into a deep silence because thoughts, they come from silence. The source of thoughts is pure silence. And thoughts appear out of silence. So when you follow your thoughts back to the source, you dive into a silent field, a unified field of oneness, a unified field of love, a state that helps you migrate from your thinking mind into your heart, into your being.
So go ahead, relax, take a deep breath, and just without really trying or putting a lot of effort, simply dive within yourself. Simply bring your attention to the source of your thoughts. This should be very effortless. Don't push it. Don't force anything, just simply allow yourself to fall into the silence, fall into the presence. Hang out in this place, hang out in this moment. Just enjoy these moments of disconnecting from the world of thoughts, disconnecting from the world of Maya, the illusion. 
and dive into your natural state, the state of being, which is quiet, present, it's static, there's love, it's away from anxiety and fear. It simply is, and it has no agenda, but it's very alive. Now, slowly, slowly come back, come back here. <clears throat> Shifting your attention to your senses. So from having the attention to the source, which is very quiet and there's not much happening, and then we shift our attention to our senses and the other world. From the inner world to the other world. So, it's one awareness that takes its focus on a different angle. It's still you, but it depends where you put your attention. If your attention goes on noise or chaos, then that becomes your reality. That becomes what you're experienced. If your attention goes on being quiet, which is also a part of yourself, then all of a sudden everything's very tranquilo and everything mellows down. So it depends where our attention goes. And of course, if you have pain, then your attention goes to pain. If you're having a headache or your knee aches, you have some physical pain, so your attention goes there. It's basically where the awareness goes to. So there is this appearance of the choice. It appears that there is, that you can choose where to take your attention to. It looks like it. So you can work with that and try to bring your attention towards inner silence, the part of yourself which is quiet, if you can. Now, the um, topic of the day is, I'm going to talk about the yani. Yani in Sanskrit means knowledge, wisdom, a yani like Ramana Maharshi, uh, an enlightened, fully realized being, like Mamri Tananda Mai, the hugging mother, um, uh, Papaji, my teacher, was a yani, Muktananda, Nim Karoli Baba, these, these are all uh, were yanis that they had come to the ultimate wisdom and in that realization and that oneness with the source, they also are freed from the cycle of 
birth and rebirth, and which um, there's been many, many different yanis throughout the history of this planet. I don't know them all. I know some of them. Um, and I know stories like, for example, the way uh, Rumi met his master, Shams. It's a very interesting story. I'm going to explain it to you. Um, but basically, um, there aren't many Yanis on this planet, uh, not that I know of, there are a few. Um, it's a very rare situation that happens with a human being that reaches the ultimate state. Uh, for example, Ramana Maharishi, and uh, once one arrives at that place, um, what happens normally is there is the disillusion of the I thought that the sense of being an individual entity separated from the source, the sense of the me dissolves. And there's no longer this sense of me as a separate entity. So the entire source is operating through that person. And um, many different things can happen when they do arrive at that place. And uh, because they're empty, they're pure, and the big kahuna is completely operating through them. And of course, there is immense uh, power of an energy field which is created around the yani. Um, they say that the Buddha, after enlightenment, uh, wherever the Buddha went, in a radius of 12 uh, kilometers, uh, all beings were affected by its presence. Wherever the Buddha went, within 12 kilometers radius would affect the environment. It would affect the human beings, the plantations, the uh, animals would sense that there is a powerful being around. And uh, the yanis, they emanate a deep, powerful uh, energy field of silence. So when you do come close to them in their field, uh, naturally it sucks you into a deep inner peace or may drive you crazy. You may just activate your mind immensely. My experience of being around Papaji, uh, Punjaji, my, my Satguru uh, was very, very powerful and many different things would happen. And uh, in the beginning, I would, I had the experience, like my mind would just go like crazy, as if you are going at 500 kilometers uh, driving uh, per hour, and the mind was just going crazy. Like I've never experienced that. And I did experience going into a deep silence of absolutely no thoughts and being in this very powerful, blissful state. Uh, many, many different things would happen uh, being around the yani. Uh, many miracles can happen. Uh, basically, a true yani does not claim any kind of the miracles that happen as their own doing. Um, they disclaim it. But people can get healed. Uh, all kinds of things can happen. Things can get manifested and appear out of nowhere. Um, it's just the possibilities are infinite of different things when you are around these people. Another uh, beautiful thing that happens is 
in association with the yani, your sat guru, the one, the awakened one, the fully realized one, is also, they have the power of eating up your karma. And by being around them, a lot of your karma starts to burn. So sometimes it could be painful, uh, it may put you in a place of really processing a lot of old stuff, uh, but it does create like a, a grid gets activated. And when you're in their energy field, things start to speed up. And uh, it's like, um, it's like if you put a piece of meat that's got a lot of fat around it and you put it on a grill and the grill is really hot, it's a barbecue, and you put this piece of meat, let's say like a ribeye steak. And what happens is the meat starts to cook, the fat starts to melt and burn. So it burns all the fat. The, the fire. Or if you have a piece of a raw diamond and when they're mining and they pull out diamonds and these diamonds, they need to be polished, they need to be purified, they need to be cleaned up. So the diamond that they pull out from the mine is very different than the one you see in, in a jewelry store. Um, it has been cleaned up, purified, polished. And that also what happens to us in our spiritual awakening, spiritual journey, is that we go through a process of purification. And uh, a lot of times it's not pretty, it's very painful. And you, you go through a lot of things. Uh, so, but it's the recognition at a certain point in your evolution, you realize that you are going through a process of purification. Prior to that, you may think that why are these things happening to me? Uh, I have bad luck. Or you feel, you may feel like you're a victim. But that's not it. Uh, you're going through a process of purification and all kinds of things may happen to you. And you have to deal with it and face it because your dark side also comes out. And quite often when you get close to an enlightened master, to a true yani, uh, what happens is because there's a lot of light, the light also reflects uh, the person and the dark and the shadows begin to appear. So by being around awakened beings, uh, some of your worst habits uh, or dark sides may come out and pop out. So because you're close to the light and you can't hide, you cannot hide from it. So far, does anybody have any questions? Before I continue, feel free if you want to unmute yourself and ask me a question, or you can write on the chat box. No questions, nothing so far. Uh, one of the stories of the Yanis that I really enjoy is um, you can go on YouTube and uh, watch a series of documentaries that David Godman has uh, created about the life of Ramana Maharishi. He's, uh, Ramana Maharishi was uh, born in the late 18th century. And then um, around age 16, he awakened and became enlightened. And he moved to the city of Tiruvannamalai, 
and uh, he stayed there for the rest of his life. Uh, he was the teacher of my teacher. So you can go on YouTube. Uh, later on, we can post, post it for you here and um, or post it on Facebook. Uh, I've talked about this before and watch, there's like eight or nine videos uh, narrated by David Gottman about the life of Ramana Maharshi. And it's very, very interesting. Of, uh, it gives you a taste of who is the Yani and the state of the Yani. Now, there's a lot of stories about different enlightened masters. Um, how many people know about Rumi? Rumi, right? Yeah, Rumi, uh, Jalaleddin Rumi. Uh, he uh, is also known as a poet, but basically, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about how Rumi met his Satguru, how Rumi met his master, and uh, which his master's name is Shams. Shams was Rumi's Satguru. Now, Rumi was born in Konya. Konya right now is a part of Turkey, but back in the day, uh, it was a part of the Persian Empire. So Persians, Iranians, claim Rumi is Iranian. And, um, and, and the Turks, they claim Rumi is, is a Turk. So anyway, back in the time he was born in Konya, Konya was part of Iran, the Persian Empire. And uh, Rumi was born in a... Um, Rumi was born in a um, Brahmin family. Brahmin is a Sanskrit uh, word of a higher class family. And uh, his family were very known, they were very wealthy, they were of this very top notch class. <clears throat> And um, naturally, Rumi got initiated in priesthood, and and uh, he had interest in in priesthood, and he started to studying all the scriptures and literatures. And uh, for years, I think it was about maybe forty years old, forty five years old, and for years and years, Rumi was teaching uh, the gospel and of spirituality and had a big following at that time. However, Rumi himself had never had a direct experience of the self. He had never experienced samadhi. He had never gone into this place of extreme deep silence and the oneness with God. But he knew like a lot of different priests or a lot of teachers that they're teaching these things, but their teachings is not coming from a direct experience. It's simply they've read about it, but it's not their own experience and they teach it. And you know, sometimes they're very good in teaching it, but the teaching is not coming from direct experience. And that's a different story. So Rumi was working on his spiritual book and he was working on this book for about 10 years. And uh, he's sitting at, uh, the banks of a river in somewhere in Persia and uh, and the rivers so he's just sitting there and he's finishing his book after 10 years and he's at the last page last sentence 
is finishing this book is in the last sentence and everything's of course is hand handwritten it's very close is just about to finish the book and as he finishes and writes the last word and ends an old man in raggedy clothes you know weird hair and beard and dirty clothes and walks up to him and he says young man i've been watching you for a while and you look very studious and you've been writing and concentrating about putting these marks on this piece of paper what is it you're writing what is it that you are so concentrated on and a rumi who's from a brahmin family is dressed very nice and elegant and chic and he looks at this guy and he's like oh, you know what am i going to tell this guy this guy is illiterate he doesn't know anything what am i going to tell him rumi looks at him and says old man mind your own business just just go and uh sh- the old man looks at him again and says no i want to know i'm very curious what is it that you're writing what is it that you're doing again rumi takes a look at him and from just looking at this guy like what am i going to tell this guy is illiterate he says old man mind your business you you won't understand you will not understand this this is too much and then rumi uh, and, and then again the old man turns around and says no i really want to know what you're writing and by this time rumi is like my father old man gentleman please move on you don't understand these things it's not for you and finally the old man says no i really want to know what is it you're writing so finally rumi says you know what is it let me see this what are these marks you're putting on this piece of paper so finally rumi is like okay i got to get rid of this guy and he's very persistent and he says okay i'm doing this writing this and and the old man says let me see let me see i need to see it and the uh, rumi hands him the book and the old man picks up the book he goes through it looks at it and throws the book into the river and the water of river was going really fast and the rumi just goes crazy because after 10 years he just finished writing this book this was the last moment he just finished after 10 years of writing this book about spirituality god sufism and he just finished the last sentence the last word and this guy picked up the book and threw it in the river rumi goes crazy Rumi goes crazy and starts screaming and yelling at at the old man like you idiot you stupid you illiterate what the hell did you do you destroyed 10 years of my work i mean Rumi literally wants to kill this guy i mean he's so angry his face is red he's just his eyes are just 
bloodshot, he's ready to kill. And then the old man looks at me and he says, what is it, what is this thing that you are willing to kill somebody over it? What is it? What? You are so upset that you're, you are going to look at you. You look so elegant and you look like you are a spiritual teacher and all your awareness and everything is out the window over some piece of paper and you're willing to kill. And Rumi is like, of course. And he says, what, what do you want? You want your book back? Do you want it back? And Rumi says, of course, you idiot, I want it back. How, how do I get my back? You such an idiot. And then the old man does his hand like this. He puts his hand towards the river and the book starts to fly back from the river, spins back, spins back, spins back, dries up, all the writings come back and comes to old man's hand and the old man gives the book back to Rumi and he says, here, take your book, have it back. And at this point, Rumi is completely shocked and his jaw dropped. He's like, what the hell just happened? He can't believe what happened. And Rumi says, how did you do that? And the old man says, you won't understand. This is beyond you. You don't, you won't understand. And the old man walks away. The old man walks away and Rumi is complete shock. And a minute goes by and all of a sudden Rumi realizes that he just met a Yanni. He just met a fully awakened master. Actually realizes he just met his sat guru. So then Rumi starts to chase him, trying to catch up. And his master's name, the old man's name is Shams. Shams Tabrizi. Shams, who's from Tabriz? Tabriz is a place in Iran. So for one year, Rumi is chasing him. And anytime Rumi arrives at any town, because he's asking people, have you seen Shams? Have you seen this guy with this looks? And every time he gets to any new town, people say, yeah, he was just here. He was here five minutes ago. He went in that direction. And if you hurry up, you're going to catch up with him. So this went on for one year. For one year, Rumi's going from one town to another town, to another village, to another city. And wherever he gets to, when he asks for Shams, people say he was just here and he just left. Hurry up, you're gonna catch up with him. So after one year, Shams, his sad guru, reveals himself and allows Rumi to find him. And then after that, Rumi's true training begins with his sat guru. Because all these years, Rumi was writing all these books, reading all these books, 
going through all these things, teachings, but it wasn't coming from a direct experience. All this was like academics. It was like something he had read. And then a phenomena happens. That phenomena is a love affair. The love affair happens between the Sadhguru and the disciple. It's not just like the disciple falls in love with the Sadhguru, the Sadhguru falls in love with the disciple too. And the love affair starts in between the two. It's not of course romantic, but there's a lot of love with between them. And since this love happens and the heart of the disciple opens up, then the sad guru is able to transmit wisdom to the disciple, to the follower. And in that transmission, the disciple starts to receive the wisdom and understanding. And of course, the disciple is saved because only through that love of guru, the power of the guru, an encounter with the yani, with the sad guru, we can be saved. Otherwise we're lost. We're completely lost in this ocean of Maya, in the world of thoughts. And we fall into deep abyss of fear, worry, anxiety. And we really start to believe the world that we are perceiving is real. So greed, anger, jealousy, fear of death, everything takes over and it sucks you in. And then you have to come back for a few more rounds. But when you do encounter the, the sat guru, the sat guru begins to eat your karma and also bring you back to the light, bring you back home to the truth of who you are. And it, be, it begins to illuminate and burns out your illusion that you are your thoughts, the illusion that you are your body, you are your emotions, your illusion that you are your money, you are your financial status, the illusion that you are your greed or anger or jealousy, all these things are slowly being burned and removed. And you're being invited to come home back to love, back into your true nature. So what happened was as a result of that, Rumi gave up his practice. He gave up his students and he gave, he offered because he realized that finally he met the Sat Guru. So, and he wanted to be, he realized like, I want to be with my Sat Guru every moment of my life because this is it. This is the way back to full awakening and coming home. So Rumi started to provide because he was wealthy and he wanted to give everything he had to Shams, but Shams didn't care. He didn't want Rumi's stuff to him. It didn't really matter, but 
Rumi started to provide for, for Shams and create things so Shams is not living in poverty. And Rumi dedicated his life to his sad guru from then on. So the story goes on and Rumi's followers and family, they get very annoyed and they get paranoid and very jealous of the fact that Rumi became 100% dedicated and devoted to his Satguru, to Shams. And of course, they did not understand the relationship because when you're outside and you haven't been touched by the power of the Guru, you haven't been touched by the presence of love, by the presence of an awakened being. And you're, so you're judging him from their looks. You're judging him from their status in society. And of course they were judging Shams, Rumi's sad guru, because, you know, it was kind of a raggedy old man and he didn't look wealthy, he wasn't wearing the Brahmin's clothing, he didn't have any land, he didn't have any sheep, he didn't have any property, stuff like that. So they were judging him, but they didn't know who he was because Shams did not show himself to those people. He only showed himself to Rumi. And that's normally what happens, that your relationship with your guru, your sat guru, the teacher, is your direct experience and connection with the teacher. You may bring your friends and say, oh my God, check him out, check him out. He's amazing, she's amazing. And they may come and sit with you and meditate, but they don't feel anything. To them it's like, okay, this guy, this, this teacher, this woman, she, she's nice, he's nice, but they don't feel anything. But then your connection is different. You are just going into these places of divine oneness and complete ecstasy, but they don't feel it. So what happened was the disciples plotted an assassination. And uh, of course, Shams knew that. Shams already knew that Rumi's disciples are going to assassinate him and kill him. He knew that. And uh, he allowed it. He did not interfere with that. So Rumi's disciples, they kidnap Shams, they kill Shams. And uh, of course, Rumi finds out and he goes into a very deep sadness and mourning. And, and for one year, he didn't speak to anybody and he was mourning the loss of his sat guru. And from there on, Rumi began to write these verses, this poetry. So I believe he's written about 164,000 verses of poetry in his love affair and devotion to Shams. writing, writing, writing of his love affair with his sat guru, of his devotion. And 
But you have to understand when you're reading Rumi's poetry and whatever he's saying, now that you have this understanding of his background, he's not writing this love, a devoted poetry to an object. It's not to a person. He's writing it to God because he saw God in Shams. That was manifestation of her majesty, the supreme being. So this is his love affair with the Supreme. The Sat Guru is the Supreme. Because she or he is the one who liberated you. You received your liberation through your Sat Guru. So naturally you're going to feel this obligation. It's a natural obligation. This there's this respect, this connection that you're going to, this devotion that you're going to feel towards your sat guru forever. The sat guru is not requiring it. Like Papaji remained devoted to Ramana Maharishi all of his life. Every time we had satsang in India. There was always a big picture of Ramana Maharshi. Papaji always came and postured to Ramana Maharshi. And that's how it's been my feeling towards my Sadguru. It's like this very deep love for him always because he was the one who led me to liberation because of him. So naturally you have this deep love for them. So what happens after that is that Rumi through intense deep pain and the loss that he was experiencing, he was led to awakening, he awakened. He's awakened to the truth of himself out of that encounter with his sad guru. And uh, obviously today, Rumi's poetry is being read and shared all over the world. Hundreds of years after, now Rumi is known more than ever. around the world. So if you ever get a chance, uh, read some of his poetry. And now that you have a little background, you understand some of his status of the way he was feeling, then you will understand because everything is in, in devotion to the, to the divine being. Some of the stuff you may ask someone to do an interpretation for you, but uh, you will understand it. Anybody has any questions for me? Anything you want to share? Hi, Anita. Can you, yeah, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Something's, something's up with the, your mic. So maybe you mute yourself and unmute yourself. Let me see, let me do it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, you have to unmute yourself. Let's see if it if it goes through. Did you do it? Yeah. Uh, Zarathustra. Oh, yes. 
maybe a mundane question, but why migrating and why Mexico? Oh, <laughs> um, I was looking for a new home. And um, I was just weighing my options. Where is this new home going to be? I've been thinking about it for past few years. So it wasn't like a very sudden thing. And I uh, wanted to live somewhere more uh, smaller, someplace that there is a community and uh, I can find my brother's sisters and connect with them. Uh, some were warmer. I don't do very well. Some are which is a little bit colder. My body's changed a lot. And I never lived in Caribbean. I always wanted to experience Caribbean. So it was like, okay. Um, I went to a few different places, check them out. And they weren't resonating with me. And then Tulum kept popping up. And uh, I came here and then I just loved it. It was like, this is my new home. I don't want to live anywhere else. That, that's how it happened. That's nice. So there's a community, like uh, some kind of uh, already established um, spiritual or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a big yoga community. There is a, a spiritual community. Um, and uh, there's a lot of music. You know, you've been in my retreat. You know, I like to dance. So... There's a lot of international DJs come here and they, they play music. So I love dancing. Um, everything's easy. It's easy to get around. Um, you don't have to be stuck in the traffic for two hours to, to do something. And uh, LA was just wearing me out. And uh, it was fine before because I spent six months a year in Europe. I was coming and touring to Europe, so I could tolerate it. But then after the pandemic happened and I was there for a year and a half, uh, and I realized this is not where I want to be all the time. And what about Sedona? Wasn't that like a good option or? You know, Sedona, I lived there for nine years. Right. And I was thinking about it, but I've eaten in every single restaurant in Sedona 50 times. Oh, yeah. And I weighed the option. I realized that I'm probably going to get bored very quickly because I've been there, done that. Right. And it's got a winter. Oh, and yeah. I wanted to be somewhere without a winter. Sounds good. So, yeah. Well, enjoy. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm still in the process of settling here. And uh, when everything is settled and uh, I'm comfortable, I do want to put a, a retreat uh, because this is it's a very powerful place like Sedona. Uh, this is kind of comparable to like Egypt um, because the Mayans were here. They left their pyramids, their rooms here. And uh, it's, it's a major vortex. Uh, the water is very sexy. The beaches are white sand, very pristine beaches. The water is super clean. Um, it's quite remarkable here. I'm, I'm really like, feel very lucky that I landed here and I attribute it to the grace. It's like somehow I was gifted to be here, to come here. So I'm just thinking uh, you should give us a little tour, you know, with your uh, camera or something, you know? Uh, something. Yeah, you know, I... I actually, everyone's asking me, why don't you post pictures, more pictures? And, and, uh, and I'm actually planning on doing it uh, starting in next. My mind, I, I honest, honestly, 
I didn't have the mental presence to take a lot of videos and pictures. And uh, my, I was very occupied by trying to find a home, a vehicle, a lot of basic things, whether I'm going to live here, uh, meeting with like an immigration lawyer, meeting with a corporate lawyer. So my mind was like really trying to survival. Like, okay, what are the most uh, necessary things I need to do first? So that's where my mind was. And now that I got my house, I'm like more relaxed. And uh, what you said, I was thinking about next, next couple of days, a friend wants to go to the cenotes and it was like, great. And, and uh, I can go with my friend and we can take a lot of photos and take small videos and, and start posting it. I, I like to do that. I will do it. Sounds fun, yeah. Sounds yeah, fun. I'm glad. I'm glad you brought it up. How, how is Mexico about flying in nowadays? Like uh, visiting or how? Like total stop or no entries or? Oh no! It's you just fly to Cancun. They're very happy to have you. It's super easy. It's very very simple. Right. And um, in a way, it just feels like pandemic doesn't exist here because unless you go in a bank or you go in a supermarket, uh, nowhere else they wear masks. Right. So nobody wears masks on the street. Nobody wears masks anywhere, except you go to a bank or you go to a supermarket. A bit like it's kind of, Yeah, it's quite remarkable. Maybe because it's small, but... Mexico is small? <laughs> no. no uh, this area, Tulum. Well, that area, it, it's different, right? From from uh, Mexico City and everything else, or? I haven't been in Mexico City, so I, I don't know. I've been in Puerto Vallarta a long time ago. No, this area, it's like Cancun, Playa de Carmen, and, and, and Tulum. Right, and they decide and, for themselves. It's not like there's some uh, regulations, uh, federal. It looks like, you know, everything is free. And you can you can just go around without a mask, and nobody's nobody cares. How long it's gonna last, I don't know, but that's how it is now. But also, there's not dense cities; these are like not very populated area. So um, it's different than Mexico City or Guadalajara, which they have large population. So. They're not enforcing it, and and I'm going along with it. Nice. Right. And it looks like the tourists that's coming. You know, we have constantly having people come from all over the world. I mean, I have not seen a sign of things slowing down. Everything is like busy. The hotels are busy. Resorts are busy. Um, oh. Events. There's all kinds of events constantly happening. And uh, people coming from all all over the world constantly here, so nice yeah, place. yeah. So it's it's very easy to get here. Right, good here, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. So back to the Yani and the relationship with your sat guru. Somebody asked the question, how can we meet our sat guru? You can't. Who asked this? Okay, I need to. Let's try it again and see if we can. How about this time? All right. You, you can't meet your sat guru. That's not something you decide. It appears on your way. So it's not like I decide today that, okay, I want to go, go find a Yanni. That happens when spiritually you are ready and 
and the guru fishes you out. That's how it happens. And the guru or the sad guru that you connect with, not necessarily it's the same teacher for other people. One of my very first so-called gurus was Osho. I, uh, through my very close friend, I got connected to Osho. But uh, Osho died as soon as I got to be connected to him. And that led me to Papaji, to Punjaji, which it was meant to be there because Papaji was teaching Advaita Vedanta. And that teaching was all a non-dual teaching. It was all about silence. It was all about being still. Osho's teaching was a lot of doing, doing things. Although he knew what was going on, but he was catering to a much larger audience. He was speaking a language that a lot of Westerners around the world could understand and relate to. So he was playing with sexuality a lot. Osha played with a lot of psychotherapy, working on yourself, your past, your relationships. He created a commune in Oregon, which fell apart. He was playing with those things. Papaji was really like laser sharp focus on silence. So a lot of people were not attracted to that teaching because it's, it's very advanced and it's just one thing. It's not an entertainment center. Osha was entertaining, but it was bringing a lot of people bringing him close to the fire. So, and I feel that it was pure grace that I came uh, to this particular teaching because when I met Papaji the first day, because for me it was like, I like partying, I like drinking, I like smoking, I like sex, I liked all these things. And I was like, and I like meat. I didn't want to be vegetarian. So I thought when I go to India, like, and I have to give up meat, I have to give up sex, I have to stop drinking, I have to stop smoking. Some of it was easy to give up, but I thought there's going to be all these do's and don'ts. And it wasn't sitting with me. Or I have to get up every morning at five and sit down and meditate. And I was lazy. I was a lazy spiritual seeker. And Papaji said the first day, there is nowhere to go and nothing to do. And I'm like, what do you mean? He had no practice for us and no spiritual dogmas. So he didn't oppose any of these things. And I was like, oh, this is my guru. This guy is my teacher. And of course, uh, slowly, slowly, some of your habits start to disappear and they just fall off as you get closer. So, and you become, the more conscious you become, the more aware you become, you may still be drinking or smoking or doing whatever you're doing, but now awareness is there. You're doing what you do with awareness. You're not doing it like a robot, things change. Advanced spirituality has nothing to do whether you smoke cigarettes or you drink or you have sex. It's 
Ar arriving in this place of fully aware of what your body does, what your nervous system is doing, you have awareness of it. That's very different than when you're asleep and you're acting like a robot. I don't know if this makes sense to you. And sometimes you have to go through extreme discipline before you come to this point. It all depends who goes through what, but that's my realization. I have a couple questions here. I can't seem to quite quit drinking alcohol even though I seem to suffer because of it. Should I just quit this or keep on drinking and it? Uh, Nicole, uh, Nicola, Cesar. Nicola, are you there? Let me see where you are. Do you want to talk to me directly? I don't seem like I'm finding you. Can you unmute yourself? All right. Okay, so I have someone here wrote, I can't seem to quit drinking, drinking alcohol, even though it seems it, I suffer, I seem to suffer because of it, should I just quit this or keep or keep on drinking and enjoy it? <laughs> Look, if you can't quit it, you have a habit and you cannot quit it. And then embrace your habit and drink consciously. Just bring awareness into your habit so the worst thing you can do is you can you drink and then the next day you beat yourself up because that's the nature of the mind i will come and say you stupid you idiot you're still drinking and you're judging yourself i would say embrace what you do and be aware you are aware that you're drinking. So when you're drinking, remind yourself that you're consciously drinking and you're aware that the next day you can feel like shit. And when you do feel like shit the next day, your mind will come to beat you up. So bring your awareness there that you were aware of what you were doing and consequently, the next day, you're just going to suffer. Let your body suffer, but don't blame yourself for what you did. Don't allow your mind to go to this place of beating you up. Simply be aware of the mind because it's going to come and blame you. So bring this awareness into your drinking habit or smoking or whether you're addicted to sugar or whatever is your story, or you like to drink cough medicine or whatever, or you're taking pills. I don't know, whatever you do. I never tell people what to do or what not to do. But what I share is simply bring awareness to it. And once you bring awareness to it, a phenomena takes place because now you're no longer drinking or smoking like a robot. Now there's awareness there. And you are total with what you're doing. You're 100% one with what you're doing, even though that habit is damaging your body. But you have awareness of it and there's no mind boggling. So make that shift. And in making that shift, what happens is you're allowing for the space to open up. 
because you're no longer in this contracted place of beating yourself up. And then falling back. It's a vicious cycle. You beat yourself up for a day or two. And then after two days, you go back, start drinking and you feel great. And then the next day you start beating yourself up. That's the worst thing you can do. Bring your awareness and be aware of the whole process. And by bringing that awareness and not beating yourself up, space opens up. Something relaxes, something is opening. And of course, you pray, you ask your, your higher self to free you. You ask your higher self to guide you to light. Instead of beating yourself up, you keep putting it out in existence that please take my habits off of me. Lead me to the light. Let me become free from this habit. This habit is a karma. You are going to, you're going to this karma, karmic process, and it needs to clear, clear itself. I'm gonna send you a message back here. Um, Nicola. Hi, Nicola. Do you, um, I unmuted you, can you talk? No? Okay. So I did answer your question. When you get a chance, because I know you lost your connection, uh, you got bumped out of Zoom. So later on, when you get a chance, watch this, this recording, uh, and then you will see how I answered your question and see if that's going to help you or not. Okay? Another question? Please. Um, I had an idea talking about yanin, yanin, that yanin. There's, there's like a, not an opposition, but there's like a two part, a, a yanin and a bhakti being two different paths, like yanin being knowledge and bhakti being a devotional path. Am I confused with okay. the words or something? Um, right. The, the yani was the definition of the, uh, it's, yeah, the part you're confusing is there, these are not paths. Bhakti is a path, path of devotion, like arriving through devotion to the divine self. The other part of that is the path of inquiry by questioning and inquiry, who am I? So one is worship or doing a lot of chantings and dancing and losing yourself in the oneness. And the other one is questioning. What Yani is, we're talking about the master, not not the path of the master. Yani is the one, the sad guru, the awakened one. Is there a word for that inquiry, that kind of way of, uh, you know, deep, deeping, deep, uh, diving deep? Yeah, in? yeah it's, it's what Ramana Maharshi, Papaji, Nisargadat, um, Maharaj or Aramish Balsakar, this is the Advaita Vedanta teaching. The Advaita Vedanta is a path of inquiry, self-inquiry. So it's a different school of way of getting to self-realization. And those teachers, Advaita Vedanta teachers are teaching self-inquiry and then there's like Mamritananda Mai Amaji, which 
she's teaching and she's sharing the path of bhakti, which is the path of devotion. So they have a lot of bhajans, they have a lot of kirtans, there's a lot of gatherings that people come together and they're singing devotional songs. And they do a lot of prayer and they lose themselves in divine oneness. So that's one school of, you know, there are different ways to get to the top of the mountain. So I was never attracted to that. My attraction was to Advaita Vedanta which was the path of inquiry, self-inquiry and silence. Thanks. Hello? Yeah? Hello? Yeah, it's Nicola, it's Nicola here. Uh, I uh, put the question earlier about alcohol, but I hadn't figured out um, how to unmute. Uh, it was, uh, I had to change the settings uh, on my phone. No problem. Uh, Great. Can you, Nicola, can you speak a little bit louder? Louder. I yeah, think that's... I, most people accuse me of speaking too loud. That's funny. Okay. Yeah, I can. Um, well, I, I think I got the gist of your answer there anyway, but uh, if you can just uh, wrap it up shortly so I didn't miss anything, that would be nice. Right. So, do you mind if I share your question with our audience? No, not at all. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, I got this from you. It says, I can't seem to quit drinking alcohol, even though I seem to suffer because of it. Then it says, should I just quit or keep on drinking and enjoy it? So, yeah, right. I, right. Is that correct? That's the question, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Right. So, the, yeah, if it doesn't seem like you can quit it, then you, what I shared earlier, and I'm going to repeat myself, is simply be aware. Be aware of your drinking pattern. Just simply bring awareness to it. That now you're not drinking robotically. You, you are aware that you're drinking. And, and in that shift of being aware, also come to this place of self-acceptance. Because when you're drinking, you're enjoying it, you have fun. And then the next day you wake up and you hate yourself or you may beat yourself up. So the mind is going to come and blame you for what you did in the night before. So you want to be watchful of the mind coming and beating you up. And not go there. Just simply having an awareness that now the mind is going to come and blame you. And then two days after, the same mind is going to come and tell you, drink. Mm, so, right. yeah, by bringing the awareness there, so there's awareness here, and is aware of the mind, you've already separated yourself from the thought patterns, and you have already separated yourself from the body who wants the alcohol. Awareness has nothing to do with it. So once you come to the full awareness, you are not drinking. 
your body is drinking and your body suffers, but you are aware of the drinking and you're aware of the suffering and you're aware of the joy, but you are not them. You are simply aware of them. So, yeah, this way you become total with what you do. You drink, you enjoy it, and then the body suffers. But now there is no mind boggling about any of it. There is no judgment that you should do it or you shouldn't do it. It's just a process that takes place, and there is somebody here completely aware of this process. So now a shift has taken place. And in that shift, that you are no longer involved with this process. You're not blaming yourself or you're not claiming the joy. You're simply aware of what is happening. So something opens up, there is space. And in that opening of the space, which awareness is here, what happens is the possibility of breaking free from this habit, it becomes more possible and more possible. Am I making any sense? Yeah, totally. It, it, it's, uh, I think it's uh, exactly what I wanted to hear and it makes total sense, yeah. And it's amazing. Right. Be aware. Be aware of the mind is going to come and do all kinds of self-judgment. So, and just simply be aware of the thoughts that come the next day. And, and of course, you're hanging, you're not feeling good because the body is suffering. So it brings depression and it's very easy for the mind comes and says, oh, you idiot, you stupid, you never get better you're never going to get anywhere and no the mind is going to come and tell you these things but this is a karmic pattern that you have to burn so until you finish this karma that you have with alcohol it's not going to stop so simply be aware of it and go through it and let it till it ends on its own and in the meantime you put it out to existence, which I'm sure you have, and you ask your guru, you ask your higher self to free you from this karma. But don't go in any of the same self-blame and beating yourself up. That's a phenomenon of the mind. Simply bring awareness in what you're doing and enjoy it when you're drinking. What a wonderful answer. I am totally pleased with it and totally thankful for it, no doubt. That well, th amazing. thanks for being open and sharing this. You, you, that's very courageous of you to publicly share this. And I'm, I'm happy, happy to hear that and I'm happy I was able to help. And feel free to join us again here. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Anyone has any questions? Anything you feel like sharing? All right, so I don't have any public events uh, yet, um, which we are, as soon as I'm, I'm confident with being able to broadcast from here and the internet service is proper and we can do everything and I'm able to create a studio, uh, I will be, uh, announcing uh, public events that I'll have. Of course, it's online events. Um, 
In the meantime, I will continue broadcasting every Wednesday uh, from, from Tulum. I'm debating whether to switch the time of the academy back to the old time or stay with the new time. So um, I like your opinion. I did get a couple messages. A couple of people say, ask me to go back to what it used to be, which is 7 p.m. in Scandinavia from 7 to 9. Um, for me here in uh, Mexico, this part of Mexico is from 12 noon to two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, so, but I'd like to know because I noticed a lot of people missing it and our participants, they drop. So, and a lot of people show up uh, an hour after. So I'm not sure if everybody got the message that we changed time. So I appreciate if you let me know uh, give me some feedback that should we go back to the old time or not? Uh, we stick to the new time. Uh, this recording uh, from the Zoom, uh, we're recording it and uh, we're going to be putting it on YouTube. Uh, and also, we will put it on my Facebook pages. Uh, my pages. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, they're all Zaratustra 5D. And that includes my podcast and Twitter account. So if you want to uh, hear this recording on podcast or on uh, YouTube, just go to Zaratustra 5D. My website is Zaratustra.tv. And that's where you find some free content, meditations, videos, um, as well as anything is new. Uh, we'll be uh, publishing it there. And you're always welcome to email me. My email is info at zaratustra.tv. So if you have any comments or you want to share any information and you have questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, currently, I have room. I have a private program. It's a one-on-one -on -one VIP uh, tailor-made training program. It's called Life Training Program. That, that's the only program I have to offer. Uh, if anybody wants to get over the hump and you want to get over the obstacle of your spirituality and reach your goals, uh, I will work with you privately. The program takes about three months, sometimes to four months. It's 12 sessions. Each session is an hour. And I'll be happy to work with you. You can contact me. Uh, send me an email and um, we'll set up a consultation appointment. We'll go over it. I listen to what your goals are, what you want to accomplish, and I share with you uh, how we can do it. Um, so feel free to reach out. Let's see what else we got here. Six to eight, six to eight. So, yeah, people. Few people are asking soon. It's going to change. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Some people say start at the 19. Some people say start at the 18. Okay. Let's feel it. Um, I believe as of next Wednesday, Amir mentioned that we're going to have a time change. So I uh, haven't checked to see what day the time is gonna change, but uh, pay attention to our next uh, 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 poster that we're gonna be putting up for the Academy uh, with, with the new time. So we're not, getting, I don't know, when, when do you change the time in Scandinavia? Does anybody know? When do you go to, uh, 
Uh, anyone here? There it is. Maryam? Uh, yes, hi, Sarah Fuster. It's Saturday, Saturday night. This Saturday, the time's going to change. And what, what it, so. It, it goes ahead. We, we put it ahead. And so before you go to sleep, you're, you're supposed to like turn the clocks ahead. Where, what country are you in? I'm in New Jersey. Okay. So, so I'm on the same time. We're so, on the same okay. time. All right. So in the U.S., uh, the time's going to go forward. Yes. So right now, it's almost 2 o'clock. It's 1.50. So the time's going to go one hour ahead. Yes. Okay. Anybody? Uh, uh, Cecilia, does it change in Mexico too? The time changes in Mexico or no? Thanks, Mariam. I appreciate it. In Sweden, it's the 28th. The 28th of March. Yes. Okay. So, all right. Fact, an hour ahead. Okay, 28th of March. I'm going to make a note out of that. What about uh, Cecilia? Do, do you guys change time in Mexico? Uh, yes, they do, and it's one hour, but I know exactly. I think it's going to be the same, uh, the same day on Saturday, but I'm not aware of um, how that changed. But I, okay. I'm uh, in the uh, in, uh, in uh, according to Mexico City, uh, change one hour. Okay, so I'll just do a little research. Uh, if it's very much possible that Mexico is synchronized with the U.S., so so if the time goes one hour ahead, that means if I'm broadcasting at twelve. Um, that's going to be as if we're doing it at 11 o'clock. means it's going to be 5, five o'clock in Scandinavia. Mm. Okay, I have to do a little time calculation before I can... So, okay, so why don't you please pay attention uh, on an email we're sending you and our posters that we're going to be putting and do a time calculation. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to the same time. So I'm going to try to make sure, in order not to create any confusion, that we're broadcasting at 6 p.m. in Scandinavia, same time as. So we'll adjust our time to you guys in Scandinavia till your time is changed, and then we redo everything. How's that? So make sure that we're on the same page. Next Wednesday, our broadcast is going to be same time for those who are in Europe, same times as this week. So we will change our time of broadcasting to adjust it to the same time as you are, which is going to be our 6 p.m., 18 o'clock. Okay? Got it? Right. <laughs> Nice can seeing you, you all. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, who's this? Yeah, it's Nicola again. Okay, uh, go ahead. I had a, a very funny a trick to remember the time changes in Sweden, in Europe. Uh, so I learned it a long time ago, and it's like uh, when you're looking forward to summer, you change the clock forward. And when you're looking back at summer in the autumn, you change the clock back one hour. Yeah. That's I like the I first part because I always love summer. It's a bummer, no. <laughs> so I, I will look forward. I thank you for saying that because I always loved summer. I was so happy summer was coming. That means I wouldn't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> Got you there. <laughs> because I, yeah, I, I didn't like school. So. Uh, it was a bunch of crap. Uh, I enjoyed it. But... 
Wow. Right. <laughs> cool. Well, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Austria and the October from here. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you for showing up. Nice seeing you all. Love you. God bless.